Reteach, podcast for teachers seeking fresh viewpoints, deeper subject knowledge, and diverse thinking. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reteach Geography podcast for teachers seeking fresh viewpoints, deeper subject knowledge, and diverse thinking. Visit reteach.org.uk slash subjects slash geography for resources to help you offer students broader perspectives on key topics and free to access guides all written by subject experts. I'm your host, Kit Marie Rackley, and my pronouns are they, she. And joining me today is a scientist who is held in very high regard in the teaching community, speaking from experience, not just for his expertise, but for his presence and passion regarding issues related to climate change. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to say welcome, Professor Mark Maslin. Thank you, Kit, and thank you for having me on your podcast. I mean, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and I do speak up a half on a lot of uh, geography educators. Is that um, well? Put it this way: they are probably a bit jealous of me right now, which I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. So, uh, I, I, do you know what? If, if if you make it ahead a little bit in the world, you know that's fine by me. I'm I'm always happy to talk to geography teachers and yeah. everybody who's passionate about geography around the world. Yeah, and that's true actually, because um, unless I'm mistaken, you've actually done. Uh, didn't you do an episode of the? And it's worth mentioning, giving them a shout out of uh, JogPod with the Geographical Association. I did. Yes, I've done JogPod. Um, the thing is, I, I'm I'm just one of these people. If somebody says, oh, "Can you come on my podcast?" I go, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> What do you mean you only have 10 listeners? That's fine. That's 10 more than I usually get. <laughs> awesome. Right. So we're here to talk about um, one of your very, very uh, popular book um, regards to um, climate change, how to save our planet, the facts. And I really, really love this book. It's the way you set it out is quite unique, but I just want you to tell us, uh, rather than me telling people, how would you sum up your book and where did your idea come for it okay so the book comes about because i was struggling about how to communicate climate change and we've all read those worthy books you know these are by friends and colleagues of mine you know sort of uh catherine hey ho you know sort of michael mann even bill gates has written a climate change book <laughs> and i have to admit that i've written one of these worthy books as well and so I was struggling about how to do it differently, how to communicate to people who don't want to read those huge tomes. And actually, I'm a great listener to podcasts. And one of my favorite is In Our Time by the BBC. Mm. I have to say I've been fortunate enough to be with Melvin twice, uh, but I love listening to it. And there was one particular episode which was on Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which is one of my favorite books. Huh. And it's all about um, a general telling his Chinese colleagues how to fight a war. And it's all in single sentences. It's all very simple. And it sings like, have more men than the enemy. Have more <laughs> spies. Do not put men on the ridge with sun behind. You know. And I thought, oh, this is really good. And I realized I actually had three copies in my book. Yes, I'm such a geek. I had three <laughs> translations. I went through and I went, this is a great style. Mm. So I went to my editor, my uh, publisher, and went, look, I want to write a book like this. And they went, I'm sorry? What? <laughs> and, they, and it's the first time ever that I've actually had to write chapters. <laughs> so I had to write a couple of chapters, submit them to uh, my publisher. And they went, oh, we get it. And then I started to write the whole book and it started to really come together. And the key thing is each one is a single sentence, maybe a double sentence, but they all have a reference. So every fact is referenced at the back just so everybody can check on me. And I got to the end of this book and I thought, you know, I channeled the wisdom of 5,000 years, you know, ancient Chinese text. And I was reading through it and I went, this is just like a giant Twitter thread. So ah, literally, I had mm -hmm. basically ended up writing a book, which was just Twitter on a very long scale. So that's how the book came about. And the nice thing about the book is you don't have to read it in order. You can just pick any chapter. If you want to know how individuals can make a difference, you read chapter six. If you want to know companies, chapter seven. If you want to know how we got into this mess, that's chapter two. If you want to know how to deal with deniers? Poof, apart from actually doing nasty things to them, that's chapter four. So it's, again, you just dive in wherever you want to. You can basically mark the pages, highlight all the comments, et cetera. Um, so it's just a different, it was a handbook instead of a worthy tome to hit people over the head with. Do you know what? I love the fact that basically your entire book 
is that bot that says, unroll, please. <laughs> Absolutely. And the thing is, and I was feeling so proud of myself, so, so sort of like superior. You know, I, I, I've got this ancient wisdom that I'm now imparting back. And it's like, oh, no, it's just Twitter, but I've done it in single sentences. Yeah, unroll. Well, it's a format that a lot of people are familiar with. Millions of people are familiar with. And uh, yeah, actually, I was going to ask this question a bit later, actually, but since you brought it up now, I thought, I think it's a fantastic time to bring it up, is that you were very, very active on the run up to COP26 on on your Twitter feed. What you did, which I thought was really, really cool, was you put up um, an emoji list of tweets of how to save the planet, kind of summarizing some of your main messages in the book. And I know that like my colleagues in the teaching world absolutely lapped it up because it was like dual coding, you know, two ways of showing messages. You know, it was concise. It was to the point kids could pull it apart. I'd, I'd, I'd seen teachers do diamond nine ranking, you know, activities on your emoji list and things like that. It was, it was so powerful for such a, what seems like a, such a simple thing. So, okay, before we move on and go back to the book, right, let's do almost like a, a, a diamond nine ranking for you. Right? Okay. If you were to take, if you were to take your emoji list yep what would you what would you and i know of course we all know that we need to do a bit of everything we need to do some things more than others but what would you personally think that you would put at the top of the diamond nine ranking as like the number one thing we've got to do or we has the most impact and then maybe go from there what would you reckon my top one is talk about it very very simple so it is we must actually discuss climate change. We need to talk about the environmental crisis around the world. And when that happens, whether it's in a schoolyard, whether it happens to be in a major multi-million pound company, things happen. And a lot of people are suffering what I would call uh, climate anxiety. And I've got dear friends who are clinical psychologists who are actually working through this and helping people with this. And we all have a bit of this. And I've seen people walk into work, you know, feeling anxious because their kids have been talking about it and they meet somebody else, they have a drink of coffee at the coffee table, et cetera. And they go, I'm really worried about this. And the other person goes, I'm so glad you are. So am I. Guess what? And then change happens. I've seen a billion dollar company, which I'm very lucky to advise, who's gone from not caring about the environmental climate change five years ago to now winning all the prizes. And that's because of those conversations. And that suddenly spiraled out. Mm. And guess what? They save a lot of money. They make a lot more money. And everybody's much happier working for the company. And so it's a win, win, win in many ways. So again, top tip, just talk about it because then we can actually deal with it. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned about like the climate anxiety because just this morning on the day of recording folks, just this morning, I actually gave a, uh, a talk to a whole year group of year nines, about 200 year nines in a school just outside of Norwich. And we mentioned exactly the same things. I talked about the climate, climate anxiety, the reasons why we feel this and why it's normal, why we should talk about it. And yeah, and of course, it's for, for the very first time in the intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, of course, they mentioned mental health as an impact from climate change. It is a thing, folks. It is a thing. So if you're listening to me and Mark have this discussion now, and you're listening to this because you're either interested in Mark's book, or you have a copy of Mark's book, you already have some level of that anxiety, and you just need to talk about it. You know, to access it, accept it, and we're all about moving on from how we can use it to empower ourselves. So I would totally agree that 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 is top on my list too. I also think that it is really important We allow young people to talk about it because, again, I remember being young. You're disempowered. You don't have the vote. You don't have a say. You're not an adult. You do not get people to listen to you, even though you can clearly see that the old generation are doing things just completely wrong. And it's really (laughs) deeply frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, I think by talking about it, but also what I'm doing, and many of my sort of like, uh, I would say, colleagues, we're talking about solutions. We're talking about the positive. We're saying, yes, this is really bad. But guess what? We're humans. We know about it. Yep. We basically can do research. We can do the science. Therefore, now we're switching to, well, hang on. We're really smart. Let's deal with these issues. Let's actually work out how we can actually reduce emissions, how we can actually reverse deforestation, how we can stop plastic pollution going into our rivers. And they're all there. And it's just now about empowering people to actually think, okay, so there is this better world. And I think this 
all came about through the pandemic and COVID. People literally were stuck indoors, saw that nature got better, but they didn't. And then they suddenly realized, well, hang on, we can envisage a better world. We don't have to do the same as we've always done, you know. Mm. Therefore, I think we've been really released from our dogma by the COVID to allow us to think we can do things in very, very different ways if we want to. Yeah. And you have an afterword in the book saying, you know, kind of like elaborating on what you just said regarding like how COVID is, we need to see it as for for all the ills that it's brought, we need to see it as the as the potential positive disruptor that it is to kind of like give us that frog in a hot water moment, you know, that this is what we need to do. And um, I really do strongly recommend folks that when you pick up Mark's book, you know, you really do kind of like dive into that afterward and see where, how we can move on from, uh, from here, from what we've learned from COVID. I just want to read out to you, Mark. Um, So your book appears on uh, the reteach list uh, that Catherine Owen put together, so uh, geography teacher Catherine Owen, uh, of climate change and natural hazards, what might the future hold? And um, she, well, I've spoken to her personally about this, and she sings sings praises about the book and how it could be used in you know in the teaching mode. But let me, this is it's a little bit long, folks. But if you just if you listen up to this, this is what Catherine said about Mark's book in terms of how it can be used in educational settings. So learning about climate change can be overwhelming and upsetting, but Mazin achieves the impressive feat of being clear about the threats we face while presenting this handbook for saving our planet in an optimistic way. Chapter five, potential futures, nightmare or ecotopia considers a potential nightmare in 2100 where global temperatures have risen over four degrees and heat waves are as high as 50 degrees Celsius. This is followed by a description of an ecotopia in 2100 with a 1.5 degree increase, fossil fuels replaced by renewables, cities linked with electric trains, more people eating vegetable based diets. And then for chapter six shows ways of how we can work towards ecotopia. And chapter seven and eight discuss how businesses and governments can make a difference. This is an excellent book to show students how the decisions people make now will shape our future. So that's wow. that's her recommendation to teachers about your book. Wow, I couldn't put it better. I'm yeah. going to definitely have to um, send her a bottle of wine at some point. P- print it and frame it as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, Catherine, and, and Catherine is someone who, who very, in a very positive manner, doesn't mince her words. She's, yeah. if, if that's truly how she feels the benefit of this with, with her students. So I want you to picture this then, then Mark. So most certainly... Catherine and her colleagues will have this on, on her staff library shelf or the school library. But you visit a school, you're giving a talk, and you notice that you've got a copy of your book in the staff library or the student library or both. What do you think it is about your book in particular that might be compelling to teachers or students? I think it is the ability to have information in a very simple, straightforward way. You don't have to read pages and pages of explanation. You don't have to dive through sort of like somebody's morass of sort of like worry. I try to distill everything down to simple facts. Now, their interpretation, I mean, one of the chapters, I interpret the whole of human history within different types of human society, you know. Now, that is just a way of actually framing the debate and allowing people to see it. It's also a really quite freeing genre because I can literally make single statements and then just walk away. I don't have to explain them. People can then take that, like famous quotes, and then go away and go, I'm going to think about that. Marx basically now said this, do I agree with him? You know, so for example, one of the throwaway lines is governance or good governance is the most powerful weapon to deal with climate change. That allows people to go away and well, hang on, why is that? Oh, actually, if your government is supporting and looking after you and protect, you know, it, it opens up. So that's what I was trying to do is produce lots of facts and quotes that allow people to open up their own thoughts. And that's the key is allowing students to think for themselves, allowing them to go, Mark says there can be a better world. How do we get to it? He's given us some some little steps on the way, but actually he's letting us think about how we get there. And I think that's really important, empowering students to think how they can contribute to producing a much better world for everyone. The way that I like your book is set up is that unfortunately I'm no longer at the chalk face per se at the moment. But what I do like to do when I do give talks and stuff is put thought provoking things and every single one of your lines has something that's thought provoking. It can help students engage with critical thinking. As you said, it can allow them to dig deeper. They can opine, they can 
think about it. They can then check out the reference and dig a bit deeper. It's so accessible in that manner. You know, you can put these statements up and give them to a, a younger audience and kind of get them to think about what it is, or you can give them to the older students and they can dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. And you know what I also think, Mark, is that I think this is a very cross-curricular book. And I'm, I'm hoping that even though this is the Reteach Geography podcast, I really do hope that, well, if you're a geography teacher, folks, you need to get colleagues in other departments to read this book or make sure that they're listening to this podcast. Because if take, for example, in your, in your chapter two about uh, human history under mercantile capitalism, you know, you say the, the geography of Europe was created by multiple of small independent kingdoms, which were constantly at war. And then you reference that. Well, that's not just geography. That's, that's history, you know, as well. That's, that's, you know, could be even philosophy, psychology and things like that. So people can then look into that a little bit deeper and it could really be a very, a powerful thing to ac- get climate change accessible throughout the curriculum, not just in geography. And I know that's something that we're trying to fight against a lot is this is not a geography siloed problem. Well, it's really interesting that the Institute of Education here at UCL it has set up a whole program to uh, look at climate change for teachers in all subjects. And therefore, how does it actually impact in the arts? How does it impact in history? How does physics teacher? How does chemistry? And it is a way of actually reframing it in many different ways. And I think key for me sometimes is it takes sometimes a scientist or a geographer to actually do something that doesn't occur very often. We find that a lot of the social sciences are what I would call time locked. So therefore, when you do history, you will start with the Romans. You will then do the Victorians, you know, sort of like, and one of my big bugbears is that British schools, unfortunately, do not teach British empire and colonialism properly. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the issues and the misunderstandings of why are countries like they are. So in geography, if history actually taught colonialism properly, we would be much better off. So that's one of my own rants. But I think the key thing there is this time locking, whereby historians only look at a small slice of time, is problematic because you do need that deep, uh, overarching view of human history. And as you know from my own research, I research early human evolution in East Africa. I've looked at archaeology. I've looked at sort of uh, history all the way through to future history. And I think that's important, being able to go and up and down that timeline and looking at different characteristics of humanity, human societies, and why we've ended up in the mess we are currently in. Because if you understand the causes, then you can start to unpick it and go, hang on, okay, the reason we are like this is because of this political system. How do we change it slightly to improve it so we can then not make the same mistakes as we did in the past? Mm. And this is why like your chapter with the history, the prelude kind of chapters, as as I like to think of them, are really important are exceptionally important because, you know, when you talk about the European trade, you talk about the, you know, the basically genocide of an indigenous people and things like that. That is important because it reminds me of a conversation I had for my podcast with Dr. Keston Perry. And it was a very profound conversation. He was saying to me, Kit, climate change didn't start at the Industrial Revolution. In my opinion, my professional opinion, my personal opinion, it started back in the age of empire building and colonialization, you know, and he gave an example of, you know, the, the, the French deforesting the Haitian forests, you know, as, as one of those, because then you're upsetting the natural balance of the trees being deforested for that, but then you're upsetting the indigenous way of managing the land and keeping it sustainable, which is regulating, you know, indirectly regulating climate. That just blew my mind. Your book does exactly the same things because you've got here a fact that says about the great dying, about human, and then you mentioned about only the Second World War killed more people. And then people are probably thinking about, well, what has that got to do with climate change? But clearly, as you've just talked about, it certainly does. It certainly does. Well, I, I have to do a, a shout out here because that chapter in many ways, was really informed by the book that I wrote with Professor Simon Lewis, who is a brilliant ecologist who works on particularly the Congo uh, rainforest. He's also worked on the Amazon. And he's a brilliant colleague who literally is four doors down from me in uh, UCL. And we wrote a book, a worthy book, called The Human Planet. 
published by Penguin and also by Yale. And we did each of those major societies we did as a chapter. And that's when we came to the conclusion. And I, I remember him walking into my office, sitting down when the book was finished and we'd just submit it. And he looked at me and said, I think we've just reinterpreted the whole of human history. And I went, <laughs> yes, I don't think we meant to. <laughs> because you can split the human history up into, I would say, two major energy revolutions and mm. two major uh geo revolutions sort of like how we globalize and so you start off with hunter gatherers we then have domestication so energy changes so we get plants and animals that we've domesticated so you have the agricultural revolution you then have the geopolitical revolution which is mercantile capitalism you've got the expansion of european countries basically taking over, raping, and pillaging the rest of the world. You then have the Industrial Revolution, where we suddenly discovered fossil fuels as a mm. way of actually powering uh, modern society. And then after the Second World War, we moved to consumer capitalism. We have the Great Acceleration, because we then have this way of actually capitalizing and using money to produce more money to then produce more goods. And those four major revolutions seem to be the history points where everything changes. Mm. Yeah, it's, I, I love that. Have you rewritten how human history is looked upon, but necessary because we need, you know, I do feel that we're, we're in, it's, it's kind of the same process of becoming like, for example, anti-racism, you know, we, we are in this growth zone of awareness right now. But so I think these, these, uh, reimagining of our history is is very important if we want to move forward into the future. So I like that. That's a lovely little story, that one. I like that. So speaking of books, other books, um, you mentioned the book that you wrote with Simon there. Um, when you were in school and college, was there any particular book or written material when, when you were young, Mark, who, which really inspired you? It might have influenced you, perhaps? Well, I, I have to say, I was struggling with this question because the problem was that there wasn't one particular book. What I found was it was just having access to lots and lots of books. So the wonderful story that I tell is at the end of junior school, the last year, they always took us swimming uh, on a Wednesday morning. I hated that. So I had a Veruca, not particularly real, a Veruca <laughs> that lasted a good eight or nine months. And it was great <laughs> because every Wednesday morning until lunchtime, I got to sit in my sort of like classroom reading any book I wanted to. And it was wow. just that. And it was the access to things. And again, being able to picture, and it's interesting that today when we're recording the podcast is well book day as well. It's just brilliant because books just allow you to go somewhere else. Um, so for example, I remember reading Lord of the Rings as a 12 year old, you know, sort of like going, I'm going to Mordor, you know, but also reading sort of like scientific things about sort of like the Tao of physics, you know, or Tao of physics as it should be pronounced, you know, just soaking up all of this stuff. And again, I think that is the interesting thing, which is books allow you to access so much knowledge in a way that you can interpret it for yourself. And I think sometimes it's difficult when you're streaming stuff and you're watching films, you're watching series, even when you're online flicking through sort of like Instagram and things like that, it doesn't give you the time to actually think, imagine, and process. And yeah. I think that's why I will still go back and say there is a massive place for books in our society. And it's interesting, if you look at the number of books sold in the UK, they have actually gone up. They haven't yeah. actually gone down. And I think this is what I love about society and the evolution of society. Everybody goes, this is going to replace this. No, actually, when we add something new, we just add it on. We don't actually replace books in any shape or form. So yeah, one of the key things I just encourage people just to read. Read for pleasure, read for knowledge. Again, it is a very different way of accessing information than going through your Twitter feed and seeing all the arguments. And folks, um, I can tell you, Mark is exceptionally passionate and genuine with, with that idea, because right behind you, you've got, a, well, I can see three 
<laughs> rammed full bookcases there. But I, I would imagine they're not the only three you have, though. No. So these are the books that I see as workbooks. So uh, <laughs> yeah, no. And the thing is, yeah, I mean, it is literally crammed to the rafters. Uh, you're know, absolutely right, Kit. And and it's everything. So I I love the the sort of very short introduction guides from Oxford University Press because it gives me a quick dive in. My partner's Iranian, so of course I've got the one on Iran, so I can actually catch up on the politics of the country, which seem to be rather dynamic and exciting at the moment. You know, it's mm. just... I've also got other ones which I sometimes struggle with the philosophers. So I've got a whole set of introductions too, which are cartoons. I'm not proud, okay? I am. If I want to understand Derrida or I want to understand Foucault, yeah, I, I start with the comic book just to get some of the basics and then I'll start reading a bit more. That's deep. amazing. That's amazing. And off the top of my, some, oh, there was someone I did a podcast chat with a few years ago who they did a climate change comic book. It was really good. I can't the life of me. Um, maybe I'll let the uh, producer know and they'll put it in the show notes afterwards or something. But, but yeah, there is not a room in this house where, well, the only room that doesn't have a, ha- uh, a book shelf in this house is our kitchen. Every, yes. every other. <laughs> so we're, we're exactly the same. I'm just looking over at our bookshelf now. It's five tiers. On the top, I've got me my Thunderbird models, but at the bottom is all the kids' stuff and their wildlife fact files and stuff. And you're right. And it's, um, it just, what's the word I'm looking for? Relieved, really, that, you know, that books are here to stay because you're right with social media. It is so ephemeral. And I think it's not just ephemeral in terms of it's there and gone. You know, if you don't catch it on social media, it's also when you're, when you're watching TV or something like that, you can just switch on or off. And the, but with a book, you can you can have as many double takes as you like. It's like what was that? What was that? Let me go back and reread that again. Or when uh, a plot twist happens, or when a, the penny drops with a piece of information, you go back to three or four pages or or a chapter, and you're like, oh, I get it now. Or I didn't see that coming. All right, and then you can't really do that very well with um, with social media. Having said that. You are pretty active on social media. So square this with me then, Mark, everybody listening. Even though you've given a bit of a critique with social media, why do you remain quite active on it? Why are you very, because you are very active on it and you do um, respond very, very well to people when they talk about climate change and other issues. What, what do you think, why do you think it is worth engaging in social media, even though we know that books are the, the thing to go to? Books are really important for the individual to be able to satisfy whether they want to dive into a new world or they want just to have an escapism like crime, or they want to actually be able to read some science or some popular science. But sometimes you want to have the cut and thrust of debate. You want to be able to really feel and smell the blood of scientific discussion. And I think that's why I particularly like Twitter, because it allows you to summarize things very succinctly, which many of my colleagues can't do. And again, this is something (laughs) I think is really important. And I love the quote by uh, supposedly, again, by uh, Einstein, which is, if you cannot explain your science to a smart six-year-old, you don't get it. And I think that's the reason. I think it's, a, uh, and I also think as a public servant, I am paid by the taxpayer to teach in a university, to do research. That research, I should be passing on to the public. And so therefore, the knowledge that I'm gaining from being in this incredible institution of UCL and interacting with incredible colleagues all around the world, I have a duty to pass that on, to Mm. be able to say, look, this is what we know. I also think that particularly climate change has become so politicized that it is beholden on, I would say, some of us to be the gatekeepers of knowledge. There are a group of us on Twitter, you know, Kathleen Hayhoe, you know, Michael Mann, you know, Richard Betts and people like that, who basically make sure that things are balanced because- Yes, we all recognize climate change deniers when they go on and going, you know, the science isn't settled or it's going to cost us too much to do this. But also we have people who are incredibly passionate, NGOs who are basically going, the planet's going to die in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, no, it's not. Okay. And so it's weird position that sort of like as a scientist, I get attacked by both sides. And I'm there with my colleagues holding back the Red Sea type thing going, you're wrong. You're wrong. Is it bad? Yes, it is. Are there things we can do about it? Absolutely. Therefore, 
Do not give up hope, don't give in to the doomism, but also don't listen to the people that just want to make huge amounts of money out of you and basically <laughs> burn up the planet. And I feel like I'm holding the walls apart with everybody yeah. else going, yeah, yeah, this is the path. <laughs> Let's go across the Red Sea. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Let's go to the promised land. Let's actually have a much better future. Yeah. Oh, what a fantastic way of putting it, Mark. Yeah. And I've, I've been engaged in that debate myself and just, you know, with the talk of the year nines, I showed them the, uh, the fantastic maps that Esri have put together with the Met Office about the projections into, so using the UKCP's two point, uh, something model. So folks, what that is basically, that's, that's the Met Office's climate models into the future, which have a very fine resolution. So you can go down into the local scale. And what is quite apparent is that yes, there are climate changes that are unfortunately unavoidable to the middle of the century now. But if you switch scenarios between say, what we should be doing for the Paris Agreement compared to if we carry on the way we are at the moment, the difference in the latter half of the century is quite substantial. It is very substantial. And a year nine came up to me at the end of the talk and said, thank you for that kit. I now know, you know, mitigating is still very, very important. It will always be important because, because it will help us to adapt into a more stable climate. I was like, yes, that's it. Is there's, there will never be, it's too late. Yes, the situation is dire, but we're in this game and we're always going to be in this game. So let's get it done. So that's a brilliant thing to end on. So Mark, have you got anything else you would like to uh, finish off with or, or end with, or maybe a partage message that you would hope teachers would carry forward from this conversation? I think the most important thing, particularly for this podcast, is to remember that geography is a unique subject. We are able to take on sciences, social sciences, and the humanities and allow students to be able to move between them. And I think that's really important because as we're looking at the issues in the future and we're looking at how to deal with geopolitics, how to make people more secure, how to deal with global poverty and lift billions of people out of extreme poverty, when we're looking at climate change, when we're looking at the environmental degradation, these all require technical solutions. They un need an understanding of science, but they un need an understanding of people and politics. And therefore, what we need is that new generation that can actually deal with information in all of those subjects and produce policies and solutions that really make a difference. And one thing I'm going to end on is students sometimes come up to me and they go, Mark, what job do I need to do to make a difference for climate change? And my answer is any job you want to do. And they look at me and go, what do you mean? I said, you don't have to be an environmental scientist. If you happen to be an accountant, that's fantastic because accountants are going to have to deal with what is the cost of carbon? How are you going to account for carbon? How are you going to make sure you're reducing carbon? I said, if you work for a fashion house, and one of my students, brilliant student, is now the sustainable director for um, Estella McCartney Amazing. before the age of 30, you know, <laughs> wow, you know, huh, make me feel inadequate. Again, <laughs> guess what? If you go into fashion, you can make it more sustainable. So any job that any geographer or any of the students that we teach go into can make a huge difference in the world. What an amazing message to finish on. Mark, it has been an absolute delight and pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for, for joining on us on the podcast. Absolute pleasure, Kit, as always. This podcast was produced for Reteach. The producer is Michael Trasinski. Please visit reteach.org.uk slash subject slash geography for resources to help you offer students broader perspectives on key topics and free to access guide, all written by subject experts. I'm Kit Marie, and thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.